I'm Rod Giltaka. I'm the CEO of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. The Canadian government is banning guns. But did they base their decision on real evidence? Or is the truth a lot different than Canadians think? We're about to find out. Gun Ban Canada. Good evening, and welcome to Gun Ban Canada Exposed. In this series, we examine the arguments used by the Liberal Party government to justify their controversial Bill C-71 and the massive May 1st gun ban. Tonight, we attempt to answer these questions. Why is it our entire system seems incapable of providing us true information on the gun debate? Why is it that we find ourselves in a position where we don't know who or what to believe? The short answer is because our system is broken. The way Canadians get their information, the process of lawmaking in Canada, the increase in corruption in our institutions, these things almost entirely prevent Canadians from understanding complex social issues. And this is why it's so difficult to solve our problems. Concerning how we get our information, people form their opinions on what is true or false from a variety of sources, personal experience, conversations with other people, the media, politicians. We consider information from all kinds of places. However, some sources and institutions were taught to believe by default, like experts, government, politicians, media doctors. Many of us think that these people have some obligation to be truthful, but the reality is they don't have that obligation. And more often than you'd think, they aren't truthful. So a broken political system combined with people who are biased and less than truthful results in a public believing things and acting on them, even though they're demonstrably false. One of the easiest ways to misdirect people is to inject emotion into issues rather than facts. The most effective emotion to motivate and control people is fear. Even Justin Trudeau warned of the use of fear as a political tool back in 2015. Leading this country should mean you bring Canadians together. You do not divide them against one another. Fear is a dangerous thing. Once it is sanctioned by the state, there is no telling where it might lead. It is always a short path to walk from being suspicious of our fellow citizens to taking actions to restrict their liberty. And that, to borrow a phrase, is not the way we do things around here, not in Canada. He was right. Fear is a dangerous thing, and it should never be used to replace an honest, mature approach to solving any problem. But unfortunately for Canadians, Mr. Trudeau has deployed more fear for political purposes than any prime minister before him. And his ministers and aides are right there to support this strategy. Stay positive and not engage in personal attacks. I will also be very sharp wherever we see significant policy differences and whenever uh, someone is uh, pulling up intolerance and playing fear uh, as uh, a way of getting elected. We believe that the choice is very clear. Liberals want to strengthen gun control. Conservatives want to weaken it. The Conservatives want to loosen gun laws. We want to strengthen them. These weapons were designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time weapons that were not designed for hunting or for target shooting. They were rather designed for soldiers to kill other soldiers. Military designed assault style weapons of, of frankly mass murder. They're designed for only one purpose, to kill people and to look like they can kill people. They were designed for military use. They were designed for soldiers to kill other soldiers. Canadians deserve more than thoughts and prayers. It's very difficult for normal, everyday Canadians to resist this kind of constant, repetitive messaging. Because most people trust the government by default. The government and its ministers know this. They know exactly what they're doing and how to do it. These weapons were designed for military use. They're designed for soldiers to kill soldiers. Their only real purpose is, is the killing of people. These assault weapons, they only are designed to do one thing to kill as many people as quickly as possible. 
I said that if you actually say it louder, we've learned in the House of Commons, if you repeat it, if you say it louder, if that is your talking point, people will totally believe it. If you repeat it, if you say it louder, if that is your talking point, people will totally believe it. When the federal government hits a particular narrative this hard, it takes a tremendous amount of risk and courage to tell a different story, even if it's completely true. And when the media supports false statements and inflammatory rhetoric, and they do, for a variety of reasons, it's near impossible for the average Canadian to tell what's true and what isn't. When we come back, we'll look at some specific examples of politicians and governments telling Canadians one thing and the truth being another. Stay with us. During the introduction and progress of the Liberal Party's Bill C-71, the government rolled out its talking points, even though many of them were highly misleading at best and at worst, completely false. The government pushed on in an effort to make Canadians believe these things. A great example is Trudeau's claim that gun owners never needed to show a license to buy a firearm. And in this next clip, he says, if the Conservatives were to repeal Bill C-71, that this would be the law in Canada. Now, Conservatives have said they would repeal this legislation. Well, if Conservatives remove enhanced background checks, people will no longer need to show a license when buying a firearm in Canada. So, together with new federal investments, this bill will combat gun violence and... Trudeau and his people made these statements many times, and it was untrue. The law concerning transferring a firearm has been the same for the last roughly 30 years. And it states, a person may transfer a non-restricted firearm if at the time of the transfer, A, the person buying it holds a license authorizing them to acquire and possess that kind of firearm, and B, the person selling it has no reason to believe that the customer is not authorized to acquire and possess that kind of firearm. So the person selling it has the responsibility to determine if the person buying the firearm has a valid license at that exact time, not in the past, right now. If they had an expired or invalid license, it's a criminal offense to transfer that firearm. You have the obligation to verify a license, even if Bill C-71 is repealed. Now, to be fair, the law doesn't specify how to verify it. That's left up to the seller. But even more, the law currently adds an additional burden to the seller that they have to have no other suspicions about the purchaser. So yet another condition to make sure they are licensed. So were Canadians honestly informed by the Prime Minister of Canada? How many non-gun owning Canadians do you think believe that without the Liberal Party and their Bill C-71, you could just exchange firearms for money on any street corner with anyone without checking a firearms license? This kind of manipulation is a problem. Another example of government betraying the trust of Canadians is Justin Trudeau and Bill Blair's gun ban rhetoric. There is no use and no place for such weapons in Canada. Weapons that were not designed for the purposes for which weapons are allowed in this country, which is sporting and hunting activity. Over 1,500 models of firearms that were not designed for the, the legitimate activities of hunting and, and sport shooting. And so those are the weapons that have made this list of prohibited weapons. They, they are not designed and used for hunting, and they're not designed and used for sport shooting. It seems like everyone in the Liberal caucus agrees. But is that really true? Is there no use or no place for these firearms in Canada? As you probably well know, this is a lie. AR-15s and a variety of other firearms that were banned on May 1st, 2020 are completely appropriate to own and have been used for hunting and target shooting in some cases for the last 70 years. This is irrefutable, but again, to be fair, what would a technician at the RCMP Firearms Laboratory say? How about Murray Smith, the person who was in charge of classifying these firearms on behalf of Justin Trudeau's government? In his questioning, on October 30th, 2020, in relation to the case CCFR versus Canada, he testified under oath the following statement. Questioner, okay, as an example, you could have a rifle that is used for both hunting and target shooting? Smith, yes, there are all manner of uses or purposes like that. The AR-15 family or AR-15 platform is an excellent example of that. 
The manufacturers will often state the purpose of the firearm and give a wide variety of purposes. So, questioner, okay. Smith, hunting could be one, target shooting another, home defense being a third, security force use being others. So there's all manner of purposes for a firearm depending on exactly which manufacturer made it and what design they were imitating. So even the government's own experts acknowledge that firearms can be reasonably and appropriately used for a variety of purposes, including, of course, hunting and sport shooting, but we all knew that already. So were Trudeau and Blair's statements an accurate portrayal of reality? Or maybe they were saying whatever they thought they needed to say at the time. It's important to mention, Trudeau and Blair faced almost no pushback from the mainstream media about any of this, next to nothing. There are countless examples of completely false and manipulative statements made by Trudeau, his public safety minister, and many others in the current government. But we need hours to cover just what we've heard since May 2020. When we come back, it's not just disinformation from politicians and government that undermines the legitimacy of our system. It's the process a new bill goes through to become law. We'll have a close look at that right after this. When the Canadian government wants to enact a new law or amend an existing law, the legislative process is used. Here's an extremely short overview of how it works. First, the bill is placed on the order paper, meaning the government is letting people know the bill is coming. Next, the bill is introduced into the House of Commons in the first reading, which also serves as an introduction for the public. The second reading happens with a debate, and then it goes to committee to be scrutinized. And finally, it gets a third reading, debated and sent to the Senate. When it gets to the Senate, it goes through a, a very similar process and eventually becomes law. As I said, this is a very simplified description of the process, but the system breaks down in multiple places. So let's talk about just one of them. In the House of Commons, when the second reading happens, members of parliament are allowed to have a debate on the bill. This is the first debate in the process. During those debates, the MP can say literally anything, true or false. They can even directly lie about anything and anyone, and they're protected from legal liability. It's called parliamentary privilege. A glaring example of this comes from the debates during the Conservatives' Bill C-42, also known as the Common Sense Firearms Licensing Act, back in 2014. The act itself was entirely benign. It was a collection of measures that reduced the bureaucracy and government waste associated with primarily license-related paperwork. Here's a quick explanation. In Canada, you can legally own handguns. You need a special license called a Restricted Possession and Acquisition License, or RPAL. And if you remember from episode four, there's a very lengthy process involved in doing that. Restricted firearms like handguns are registered. They also have specific storage requirements and you need a separate permit to transport them to and from legally appropriate places like a shooting range, a gunsmith, and so on. Prior to Bill C-42, you needed to have a paper copy of the authorization of transport, also known as an ATT, with you during transport. You needed to have the paper copy with you. The change in the law was that the gun owner didn't need to carry the paper copy anymore, and if you qualify to own the handgun, then you could be trusted to take it to the range and some other common places that a gun owner would legally take their gun. All the conditions of the ATT were the same and still existed. But here was the messaging to the public from the NDP's career politician, Randall Garrison. This will automatically allow the transportation of firearms between the owner's home and a list of five kinds of places to any gun range, to any gun shop, to any gun show, to any police station, and to any border post for exiting from Canada. This provides a vast array of excuses for having weapons in a vehicle along a myriad set of plausible routes. And this change will make the prohibition on illegal transportations of weapons virtually impossible for police to enforce. And again, I want to say that's why I'm concerned about the notice the member for Dauphin Swan River Marquette has given about a bill to, to amend uh, the criminal code on firearms storage and transportation. Uh, I'm looking forward to having the opportunity in committee 
of having law enforcement representatives present so that we can talk to them about the impact of this change of no longer requiring specific permits from a specific place to a specific place for restricted firearms. I think there's a great deal of danger here for Canadians. Again, a licensed gun owner is no longer required to carry a paper copy of the ATT. All the same conditions of transport are the same and a sitting member of parliament declares this a great danger to Canadians. How is that a reasonable thing to say at any level? What do you think non-gun owning Canadians are thinking when they hear something like that? Again, fear is a great motivator and manipulator. People assume that they can trust the words and opinions of career politicians like Randall Garrison. Having investigated this topic for just a few minutes reveals you can't. And by the way, the purpose for the change was to avoid the millions of dollars per year involved in manually issuing ATTs one at a time by hand and mailing that paper copy to most of the 600,000 Canadians who hold these licenses. Again, all of the places the RCMP would previously issue manual ATTs for were the same. The conditions didn't change. Speaking of fear, here's a fundraising campaign the Liberals put out in 2014 to reinforce this disinformation. It read, Stephen Harper thinks guns like these should be able to move anywhere within a province, outside busy places like shopping malls, grocery stores, and sports arenas. And of course, silhouettes of scary looking guns. Knowing what you know now, is there anything true about the graphic you just saw? Would anything about this help Canadians understand the current system or understand the changes in Bill C-42, a government bill? It's clear the Liberals and the NDP want the public to view conservatives and gun owners as dangerous and unworthy people that are in favor of exposing Canadians to great danger for their own benefit. There's a lot more to be said about this one occurrence, but we have to move on. When we come back, we'll look at a more recent and one of the most egregious examples of this immoral behavior by Canada's political class. Stay with us. It's worth mentioning that in this format, a 30 minute television show, it's difficult to go through all the details of what the changes in the law are in multiple government bills, compare them to deceptive ways they're being characterized by politicians. There's just too much of this bad behavior going on to capture and expose it all. And make no mistake, these people know that. So, while I was writing this episode, one of the worst examples of this behavior happened. It was two days ago, February 26, 2021. Bill Blair, Justin Trudeau's Minister of Public Safety, was responding to debate during the second reading of the Liberals' new bill, C-21. The Conservative Shadow Minister for Public Safety, Shannon Stubbs, was laying out a lot of information and data that undermined Bill C-21, and it was very effective because it was true. This is how Bill Blair responded. We know that the Conservative leader has promised the gun lobby that he will weaken gun control. He has, for example, the gun lobby tells us that he's promised them that, that he'll make assault rifles legal again, that he'll remove the restrictions on handguns, that he'll eliminate all controls over large cap capacity magazines, that he'll eliminate stronger background checks, that he'll allow he con carry concealed weapons. The, the, the gun lobby has said very clearly that they've told the Conservative leader what he's to do, and he's agreed to do it. What Bill Blair just said is important to understand because it's extremely serious. Bill Blair is talking about the leader of the opposition, who is Aaron O'Toole, and the gun lobby. For our purposes tonight, that's me. Gun Ban Canada Exposed is produced by the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights, the gun lobby in Canada. I'm the CEO and executive director of the CCFR. I write, produce, and host this show so that Canadians can have an opportunity to hear the other side of the story, backed by facts and references. So now I'm talking to you directly. Bill Blair said that Aaron O'Toole promised us that he'll make assault rifles legal again. Assault rifles are fully automatic weapons. They're machine guns. They were banned in 1977. O'Toole never said anything like that to us. Next, he said he'll remove the restrictions on handguns. We are the gun lobby in Canada. He never said that to us ever. He goes on to say that O'Toole promised to eliminate all controls over large capacity magazines, eliminate stronger background checks, and allow carry of concealed weapons. 
O'Toole never told us that he would repeal magazine restrictions. He did say that he'd review them. Canada has some of the strongest background checks on earth today, and O'Toole never promised to eliminate them, nor did he tell us he would implement concealed carry. He absolutely never said that to us. Can you imagine what everyday Canadians are thinking when they hear Bill Blair say these things? No background checks, machine guns, concealed carry, no restrictions on handguns. Bill Blair is lying. I can tell you that directly because he's talking about me. In effect, the Minister of Public Safety is telling Canadians, if the Liberals lose the next election, there will be people legally circulating around shopping malls and ice rinks with handguns and machine guns. That's what he's saying. Can you blame people for being so confused about firearms and the law? Is it any wonder why people don't know who or what to believe? In this episode, we touched on a few examples of this kind of behavior. Unfortunately, we didn't get to cover the committee stage of the legislative process, which is probably more outrageous than the House debates. This is the last 30-minute episode of this series. The last episode, episode seven, is a one-hour wrap-up of all the information we covered and some updates from our previous guests. If we have time, we'll highlight some of the more egregious committee testimony. But until then, share this information, listen with a critical ear, and we will see you all soon. Good night. Closed captioning for Gun Band Canada is brought to you by Bushnell, Club de Tire Ville Saint-Pierre, TNT Gunworks, Trinity Long Range, P&D Enterprises.